Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship at Meadowbrook Congregational Church. I'm Pastor Joel Boyd, and I'm blessed to serve this great congregation. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors joining us today, either in person or our friends joining us online. We're glad to have you with us. Everyone here in the church is welcome to join us at the fellowship time immediately following worship. You can just uh, join us right outside. We'll have some nice treats outside for you there. Join Meadowbrook's growing group of young and young at heart adults for our next meeting, which will actually be this evening, for Beer, Beliefs, and Banter, also known as B3. The meeting will be tonight at 7 p.m. Everyone's invited to bring a couple beverages with them to the Memorial Garden, weather permitting, and weather has been better today. We'll be discussing a topic relevant to faith, uh, culture, and life as it uh, pertains to uh, younger generations today. So feel free to invite anyone you know and uh, to join us tonight. If you have any questions, uh, reach out to Joshua Tucker or Scott Hockett. And along those lines, friends, I invite you all to mark your calendars and plan to join us for an upcoming B3-sponsored drive-in movie, which we'll be having here at the church in the parking lot. Uh, We'll be having this... uh, in a couple weeks, uh, on uh, Friday, October 8th, everyone's invited to show up at about 7.30. The movie will start at 8 p.m. And uh, we're glad to have everyone join us there for that night. Uh, look for more details uh, to follow about that and reach out to a member of B3 with any questions. We'll be showing a family-friendly film. We'll give you more info on that soon. Team 2020 is planning a work day this coming weekend with North Congregational Church at Camp Restore, Detroit's campus in Detroit, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, October 2nd. I invite you to see the announcement uh, and uh, to contact Ken Schwartz with any questions. Now, next Sunday, October 3rd, we'll be holding our first All Family Sunday. Now, on All Family Sundays, all children and youth are invited to remain in worship for the duration of what will be uh, an intergenerational liturgy. It'll include prayers, music, readings, and an intergenerational and interactive sermon where you join in the message. Don't worry, we won't all preach for like 20 (laughs) minutes each. It'll be a very long service. So I invite you to bring your whole family and your friends uh, to join us on that day. Uh, Also on October 3rd, in the afternoon, Meadowbrook will be participating in the Novi Northville Crop Hunger Walk to help families that are struggling with hunger. So that walk will begin at First Presbyterian Church of Northville. And I invite you to see the sign-ups, which can be found online, and also today, outside, as you have fellowship, uh, Colleen will have a sign-up sheet there as well. You can speak to Colleen with any questions. Well now, friends, let us take a time to prepare our hearts and minds for worship and keep our hearts always focused on the Lord. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. We long for your saving help. Always say, the Lord is great.
join with me in the invocation and Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Lord, we know that in humility we are to value others above ourselves, not looking to our own interests, but each of us to the interests of others. In our relationships with one another, we are called to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Bless us by your presence, Lord, and keep our hearts focused on you, that all we say and do may be worthy of the path to which we are called. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. For, th for those of you who don't know me, I am <coughs> Colleen Foster, uh, Director of Christian Education here at Meadowbrook. Last week we began Sunday school classes for children and youth, preschool through high school. This was our first time meeting in person since March of 2020. So when planning for the classes this year, usually I like to have a theme as well as a Bible verse, and that helps me pick out my stories for the lesson. So in coming up with a theme for this year, I went with superheroes. And for the Bible verse, Psalm 28, verse 7, which the 27, verse 8, which says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. Throughout this year and a half, we've probably all heard that sentiment, not all superheroes wear capes. And with this, we think of all those who have risen to the challenge of fighting this pandemic, from medical uh, professionals to first responders, to teachers, to grocery clerks, so many other essential workers. And this really resonated with me because it highlighted that these are ordinary people who have shown extraordinary courage and strength during such an unprecedented time. This phrase also lends itself to a lot of people from the Bible. There are so many Bible stories that center on ordinary people who, through their faith, are able to persevere and accomplish great things. And so hopefully learning about these people help our young people realize that they too are capable of great things. So with that said, I would like to invite the young people to come forward. Maybe sit right here in the front row. That way we're still socially distant. Thank you, Clara, <laughs> for leading the way. <laughs> all right, so I know all three of you were here last week. Do you remember who we studied? That's okay, I've got a cheat sheet here. Okay, we started learning about Abraham and Sarah, also known as Abram and Sarai. Do you remember what they did? or what God said to them? Um, 
Hephthah. God said they would have as many descendants or family members as there are stars in the sky. And what was unusual about Sarah and Abraham? Were they young and in their 20s? They were old. They were older even than most of your grandparents. So it was kind of a far-fetched thing, but did Abraham and Sarah believe them, believe God? They had pretty strong faith, didn't they? They got up and they left their land and they went to a new land. And today we're going to learn about what happens next. So let's close in prayer and then we'll head off to Sunday school, all right? So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together this day. Be with us as we learn about you through the stories of your people. Bless our families and our friends. In your name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading this morning comes from the book of James, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, and it can be found on page 230 in the New Testament of your Pew Bibles. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Loving God, you call us close and tend to our every need. While so many may try to push aside those keeping them from being ahead, Lord, you place the last of us first. Lord, we continue to pray for those in need in our community. We pray your blessings on all your children, including those in our church here, your church. Lord, we continue to pray for Mary Crockett and her recovery. We pray for Karen, Cherie, and all the family of John Lafayette after the memorial service with John yesterday. We pray for Richard and Carol Munerentz. And we pray for those who continue to be impacted by health and economic concerns and all challenges in this trying time. We also pray, Lord, for the people of Haiti, of Myanmar, and Afghanistan. Lord, we raise all these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, Lord, as we raise all that we give and all that we are to you, we ask your blessing on all that we have. May all these gifts be used to further your kingdom here on earth. Amen.
Now may the Lord God open our hearts and minds as we witness for the word and the gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. This is the gospel message of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's the beginning of the school year. And after making it through the first couple weeks of classes, you feel a kind of a sense of relief that you're getting the hang of things, at least a little bit. The rest and the fun of summertime, well, that's all come and gone now. So you are especially excited to be with all of your school friends as you gather outside to play a game. Everyone's gathering to play a game of touch football. It's beautiful weather outside. All your good pals are there with you. And the day seems not so bad, even if summer is over. Then team captains are selected and teams begin to be assembled. You wait, patiently at first, as the captains make their way through the line of kids waiting to be picked. As you see the obvious big shots picked before you, well, you don't pay that much mind at first. After all, some of them are awesome at this game. So you just wait patiently as the captains continue to pick others, making their way through another round of kids that might still be a little better than you at the games. You think to yourself, ah, so what, no big deal. I'd probably pick them, too, ahead of me, if I were a captain. Round three comes and goes, and you're still not picked. You begin to get a bit nervous. I am going to get picked, right? Everyone will eventually be on one of these teams, won't they? The captains make their way through the third round, and the next, and the next one, and so on, until finally you notice it's only you and one other kid left standing there to be picked for a team. A little perturbed that it's taken this long for one of the captains to see your potential, you begin to doubt your ability. You become a little sad and feel a bit rejected. Am I actually going to be picked last, you think? Well, the first captain saves your reputation for the moment and picks you next, second to last, just ahead of the poor soul who now gets the rap of being picked dead last. Good grief, you say to yourself. That was a close one. I was almost last, 
And if I was last, I'd be the laughing stock of the whole school. You don't think so much about the kid who was picked last. In fact, you try to erase that part from your memory, instead focusing on how you can do better in the game now. If you're better, maybe you'll get picked sooner next time. Or how about this? You're having a great day, a great year at your job. The boss is excited that your division is doing so well. Not only have you met your goals, but you have actually surpassed them. In fact, you blew them to smithereens. With your annual review coming up soon, you think to yourself, how great this will be to have had such a good year when it comes time to discuss your raise. The boss is going to be pleased and should have no problem giving me that raise we held off on last year, you think to yourself. So you're caught quite off guard when during your weekly division meeting you learn that the company at large had suffered a huge drop in the market share. Your boss tells you and your colleagues, sorry team, but it looks like our optimism may have been misplaced. Despite all your hard work, which I appreciate, we're no longer in the top tier in our market. We experienced some pretty severe losses due to the closing of our branches out west, and as a result, well, well, we've sunk way down. You're shocked. You can hardly believe your ears. Did the boss just really say that? How could we have fallen so low when you've done such a good job this year? Not only you, but, but all of your team. You've worked so hard. And everything was going well. And then you remember your coming review. And they talk about your raise. Well, like the kid who just avoided by the skin of his teeth, our blindsided business employee here was shocked about being last. No one wants to come in last place. No one wants to be picked last, to be the laughingstock at school. No one wants to have their company, their job, and their future drop down to come last. It's safe to suggest that no human being really wants to be last at anything. The exception, of course, being the last to suffer. Right? Not one of us wants to be the first to suffer or the first to struggle in life. Society seems to cultivate and even perpetuate this way of thinking. We can at times seem almost to be programmed to think this way, like we're always supposed to aim for being the first in line, the best, the strongest, the smartest, the richest, the most powerful, most attractive, most healthy, longest living, and the one with the most long-lasting legacy, like a cool statue after us. Well, we might consider what this view serves, or rather perhaps who it serves. Does it serve God? Does it reflect what we know of the teachings of Jesus? Do we feel the Spirit calling us to this way of living in the world? The world that God has made. In today's Gospel lesson from Mark, we find Jesus' disciples stumped yet again by his teachings. Well, Jesus tells them a second time that he must suffer, saying, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. The disciples did not understand this teaching of Jesus. They were also too afraid to ask him what it means. So they're just quiet, they're silent about it. Yet when the disciples and Jesus come to Capernaum, Jesus asked them, 
What were you arguing about on the road? Perhaps shocked that he knew what they were up to, the the disciples, they maintained their silence, saying nothing to answer his question. Well, the gospel author then tells us that the disciples had argued about who among them was the greatest. After sitting down, Jesus makes his knowledge of their discussion clear as he calls the 12 disciples and says to them, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Since the culture in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry was different from our own, well, we cannot assume that the disciples would have received this statement from Jesus in the same way that we would. At this time, in the Roman Empire, status reigned supreme. Society was completely hierarchical. It was crystal clear who was at the top, the leaders, the bosses of the town. It was also clear who was at the bottom of the ladder, the powerless, those picked last, the least influential members of society. Now, at first, we might think, well, that doesn't sound very different from the world today. But we have to remind ourselves of the developments we may take for granted in today's world. It's easy to forget them. Things like voting rights, property rights, the ability to operate as equal or at least closer to equal members of society, in this country anyway. The same can be said for people living around most of the globe, though certainly not everywhere. This is not to suggest that our country or others have everything right. I'm not going to lie to you from the pulpit. <laughs> Right, that we've perfected everything, that we've somehow perfected freedom and liberty. But rather, the point is to highlight that how none of these rights were common to the ancient world under the Roman Empire, which is when Jesus and his disciples were living. Nowhere close. At that time, to suggest that one's status would be even compromised slightly was to propose a significant and irreversible threat to one's reputation, and by extension, to one's very livelihood. So then, the disciples arguing about status among themselves was not exactly like the kid from our story who was worried about being picked last on the team. Nor was it like the business employee who must suffer through an economic downturn, which after all, might be only for the short term ahead. Instead, this argument of the disciples was more like people arguing who would be the true heir to a kingdom, to an ancient kingdom at that. This is no egalitarian or freedom-loving society we're talking about. The society of the disciples' time, well, that encompassed extremes in disparity. There was no middle class, but there were many, many members of society categorically suppressed, as well as many who were enslaved with nearly no hope at all of positive change, none. Jesus' challenge to the disciples that the first must be last and the servant of all, well, this flips the whole Roman worldview on its head. It's upside down. Forget about your favorite status in society, it said. Instead, know that God calls you to serve his people, not rule over them, as the world suggests. As if this would not be enough. Jesus continues in his discussion with the twelve. He goes further. After taking a child and placing them, placing that child among them, Jesus takes the child in his arms and says to the disciples, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Again, before jumping to any conclusions, we should consider that this might, what this might have meant in Jesus' day of his earthly ministry. What did it mean then? Well, when we look at it this way, we find that under the Roman Empire, children were considered the lowest members of the household. 
as such, they were not important members of Roman society as anybody else older, or not nearly as much as adults were. This is a huge contrast to the way we view children in our own country and around the world today. Not only is there love, understanding, and teaching of children, but we generally take great pains to see that our children are granted opportunities to learn and to grow, to cultivate their talents and abilities, to blossom and to thrive in our society. And while not perfect by any measure, it's still quite different from the view of children in Roman times. With this in mind, then, we revisit Jesus' statement. When the disciples welcome children in Jesus' name, they welcome God the Father as well. Jesus is saying something radical, really, here. Something radical. He is not speaking to a modern audience who loves and cares for their children's every need, taking them to band practice, soccer, helping them with their homework, and making sure they not only dream of their future, but also helping them create and navigate that future. Now in this story, in Roman times, Jesus is telling the disciples that they must lower themselves way, way down, way down lower must their status go, to the point of not just associating themselves with the lowest of society, but also to welcome them in his name. To grant them the status which the Lord commands. Again, Jesus calls the disciples to follow God's will over the ways of the world. So what does it look like for us to live into God's word today? What is Jesus calling us to do about this in our own lives? How do we become less? How do we become servants? Servants not just of those around us whom already know and love, but also, how do we become servants to all, as Jesus calls us to be, beyond those we know? Although our times may be different from the days of the disciples, this teaching is nearly as challenging to follow today as ever. Must we sacrifice much of our personal belongings to heed Jesus' call to be last? Is it about giving away? Is it about doing? Doing more to help those around us or those far from us? Is it about second-guessing what we think our priorities are and what they should be in this world? If we're aiming for first place, we might ask ourselves if God is always at the center of the way in which we're going about getting to that first place. Is God part of that? Indeed, maybe we're being called to think of not only how we aim, but also why we're aiming for something to begin with. Are we trying to give glory to God? Are we considering others as Jesus calls us to? How are we led to our goals? By ambition? By what we want? Or by the Spirit? All our trophies will end one day. They'll decay and go away. Our worldly status will not be transferable to what comes next. For many kings have tried it. No matter how we might desire to climb to the top, to reach first place, Jesus reminds us to think of God and what God has to say about all this. Jesus calls us to love one another. Jesus put others before him. Through his death on the cross, Christ has placed us all before him. He was last so that we may all be first. We do not settle on being in last place because of our weakness or our lack of ability. We're called to be last so that through Jesus and with the Spirit, we glorify God and that all may be first in his kingdom.
May it be so. Amen. Friends, please rise and body your spirit in singing our sending hymn number 436. Thank you. 